great, thank you. Good, I go right in. So I benefit actually from my um, wonderful colleague, Juliette, who, who just introduced uh, Cebu Cortex development. Um, but a, a major question that we are asking in the lab is actually how you generate a, a, a brain of correct size and, and uh, the correct amount of cell type diversity. And uh, this is illustrated here and known for a long, long time. I mean, even a hundred years ago, Roman Cajal noticed when he applied this famous uh, Golgi stain that not all the cells actually look the same. There, there are bigger ones, there are smaller ones. Of course, there's different projection patterns. Today, we know that uh, based on the transcriptome, um, there are uh, specific factors expressed very selectively here in distinct layers and recent uh, single cell uh, advances, of course, uh, revealed that there is actually several dozens of different cell types based on transcriptional uh, definition, if you want, or transcriptome definition that make up uh, these cell types. Now, we also know that uh, if things go wrong, so, so if uh, there's genetic mutations, and we just also heard uh, from Juliet beautifully, uh, that um, this leads to uh, human neurodevelopmental diseases, in most extreme cases actually can result in really dramatic malformations such as microcephaly or lysencephaly, which we just heard. Now, um, for many of these cases or these diseases, actually the disease etiology is, is still unclear, um, but the nature of the genetic mutations may uh, give us insight and potentially may imply general principles. And this is kind of our inspiration uh, for our approach uh, to do actually use functional genetics uh, in order to um, address these, um, uh, you know, malformation um, based on the mutations. Now, for today, uh, I really want to focus uh, on the question, how you generate a cell type diversity out of a radionuclear progenitor cell. Uh, in other words, how does a, a very small pool of stem cells uh, uh, actually uh, generate all these different types of cells here in the cortex? So there's a, a big question, of course, to address. And uh, the approach that we are using in the lab um, is basically uh, quantitative lineage tracing. Uh, so tracing uh, the offspring or the pedigree of the stem cells um, at single cell res resolution, and then also use genetic manipulation at the single uh, cell level um, in order to obtain uh, insights into the molecular mechanisms. Now, um, we're using uh, the method that Julian already mentioned, actually that um, uh, we developed or co-developed in Stanford in the laboratory of Fletcher and Lowe, um, together with Hui Song uh, initially. And this method is called uh, mosaic analysis with double markers. Now, or MADAM. What MADAM can do is actually in a dividing stem cell that is initially not labeled, we can actually reconstitute uh, two marker genes, uh, fluorescent marker genes, if you forget tomato, here when the cell divides and thereby uh, label all the progeny uh, subsequently here in the lineages and uh, you can appreciate here there's two examples depending on the mode of cell division at least in the first cell division here um, we can actually infer a symmetry of these uh, lineage trees uh, here is a very asymmetric one and here's a more symmetric one now an additional feature of the madam technology is actually that you can introduce genetic mutations selectively into one of the lineages here in the green one um, of any candidate gene of interest. And uh, there was indeed a paper out just yesterday, um, which took us uh, 10 years, in fact, uh, uh, to complete because now we have uh, generated a resource here, uh, which is almost genome wide. In other words, we can introduce almost any gene of interest here selectively into, into such a lineage. So it's more than 96% of the genome is now accessible to uh, Madam uh, labeling and lineage tracing. Now I show you uh, another example here uh, at higher resolution and you can really appreciate how quantitative the method is. So this is a single clone from a stem cell or radiodial cell induced at embryonic day E11 and then analyzed uh, three weeks postnatally. And you can see how, how easily you can count uh, the green lineage here, the green neurons and also the red neurons. It is also astrocytes. Now over the years, when I started my lab, um, we really wanted to systematically trace uh, the lineages of uh, these radiodial progenitor cells um, and it used many different clones at many different time points. This was also a part of a collaboration with Song Hai Shi, which I believe you also already had in this uh, seminar series. And then later we also collaborated with uh, Alfredo Lorca from, from the Oscar Marine Lab, which I also believe gave a nice seminar here. 
Um, so I'm going to summarize uh, these efforts here on a single slide, um, which is a, it's a long uh, work and, and many people were involved here actually. But um, using this modern technology and the single cell resolution, we were able to obtain a quantitative framework, actually how you produce neurons and glia uh, during neocortex development. Um, so in short, you start off with uh, uh, radial glia progenitors dividing symmetrically in a predictable uh, manner, actually, uh, until about embryonic day 12. And then relatively sharply, these uh, radial glia cells start to produce neurons. Uh, and then in a temporarily uh, um, uh, progressive fashion, of course, the different types of neurons for the distinct layers. Um, also, we can predict that uh, about one in six of the radial glia cells then proceed further to uh, produce astrocytes and or uh, oligodendrocytes. Now, um, of course, we have now a quantitative framework, and this is uh, probably just the beginning, but the molecular mechanisms are, are really not uh, clear here. So first of all, what drives the switch from symmetric stem cell division to asymmetric stem cell division? What drives the temporal progression in these radio DSS to produce different cell types? and what then uh, controls the switch to uh, clear production. So these are really the questions that we are currently following up in the lab by using genetic manipulation combined with lineage tracing uh, using the modern uh, technology. Now, uh, to get first insights, uh, in fact, we were inspired by uh, work from Denis Jabodon in Geneva uh, in, in, that is uh, documented in this paper here. Namely, what they did is they isolated these radio glia cells uh, every day here and did single cell RNA sequencing. What they found is that actually there's a temporal patterning mechanism happening in these cells. So as they progress in the lineage, they actually change or have a very characteristic transcriptome. What also became evident from these sequencing efforts is that there are um, uh, epigenetic uh, regulators highly expressed at different stages in the lineage progression, one of which is a complex called PRC2 complex, and um, uh, in particular, a subunit of that complex EED. Um, I will tell you in a second what this complex does, but what was found is actually when you knock out EED in the whole cortex, is that lineage progression is anticipated and uh, these mice have a quite strong microcephaly, in fact. Um, so let me introduce uh, PRC2 complex uh, a bit more to you. So it's an epigenetic regulator that uh, controls chromatin compaction, in fact. So it's basically uh, histone methylation, uh, or it catalyzes histone methylation uh, here at this H3K27, uh, and that leads to really gene silencing. So basically, if you have uh, PRC2 activity, you silence gene expression. Now, if you remove uh, this component here, EED, um, uh, from the complex, the catalytic activity uh, is actually lost. And that leads to increased chromatin accessibility and expression of PSC2 target genes in an ectopic manner. And you can appreciate how strong the microcephaly really is here when you uh, knock out um, this gene uh, selectively in the cortex when compared to wild type. Now, um, the questions uh, that emerge here is, uh, what are actually the mechanisms um, of, of this uh, PRC2 um, histone methyl transferase complex uh, in temporal lineage progression? And um, what are the precise cell autonomous and potentially global tissue-wide functions of that complex? And thirdly, um, are there sequential functions uh, in the radiolia lineage uh, progression? And this is a project of uh, postdoc uh, Nicole Amberg in the lab, uh, and a very uh, talented bioinformatician, Florian, uh, who also joined the lab about uh, five years ago. Now, um, to address uh, these questions, what we have started to do is to establish two genetic paradigms uh, using the Madame labeling uh, technique. So in the first year on the left, um, what we do is we induce this genetic mosaic. What this means is we have green cells that are mutant for our candidate gene of interest. So EED in this case, part of the PRC2 complex. And we can compare it directly to uh, wild type cells because they are labeled in the red uh, color here. And we can trace and follow cortical development uh, here uh, in the sparsely labeled um, uh, neurons. Now, we contrast this uh, genetic paradigm to a paradigm where we knock out the gene in the entire uh, cortex. As we already have seen for ED, there's extremely strong microcephaly 
that results from the uh, global loss of, of that gene. Um, now, um, the difference here is actually, or let's say the similarity in the green cell is that the green cells are the same. So green cells are homozygous mutant for that gene. There's no difference, but the surrounding cells, they are different. So here they're heterozygous or wild type. And if the, because it's not dosage sensitive, this is a normal environment basically. And here uh, the green cells are surrounded by a homozygous mutant environment. So any difference we would see in the phenotype of the green cells um, actually reflects so-called non-cell autonomous or tissue-wide uh, effects. And um, this is really uh, um, uh, the questions uh, we're addressing here. Um, so on this next, oops, oops sorry. So, so in this uh, next slide, actually, so again, yeah, okay, you're here. So in, in this next slide, uh, these three paradigms um, are actually controlled uh, situation, all cells are white type, but we have now a sparse labeling induced by the madam. And here we have this uh, conditional knockout where we remove uh, ED in the entire cortex. You can appreciate the very strong microcephaly. And here we have our genetic mosaic where just the green cells uh, are mutated uh, for this ED uh, gene. Now, because we have such a strong microcephaly, we were thinking that uh, either uh, the green cells are, are produced at a less rate or they die off uh, more frequently because obviously they're much uh, less cells than in this condition. However, when we now look in the mosaic and compare mutant cells to wild type cells in situ, we actually see that the ratio is about one to one, meaning there is no decrease in the green cells here. And that um, actually indicates that uh, the phenotype we're observing here is really due to a global knockout of that gene rather than a single cell knockout as illustrated here. So, so that really uh, provides evidence that this complex is not cell autonomously required really for neurogenesis. Now to really test it at the single cell uh, progenitor level, we uh, again used our uh, clonal labeling trick. So we basically induced the madam clone at embryonic day 12. This is uh, roughly when we start to produce uh, neurons and we can predict the output is about eight to nine uh, neurons in total uh, when we analyze at three weeks postnatally. Now, um, if you just focus here on the unit size, which should be eight to nine neurons, Regardless if uh, it's a wild type scenario or it's an ED knockout scenario, the unit output of neurons is, is about the same. So this again shows that uh, knocking out ED in a single radial glial cell uh, does actually not change uh, the neuron output and thereby uh, is not required cell autonomously in these uh, radial glial stem cells. Okay, but then um, that triggers some questions. So what's different then if you knock out the gene just in a single cell or in all the cells? What happens in those cells? Because obviously here in the CK, you have this very strong microcephaly and a major defect in neurogenesis, whereas here it's normal neurogenesis. Again, the genotype is the same. So uh, we really were uh, thinking, okay, then uh, let's uh, try to assess this at the global transcriptome level to see what may be different in these cells. And so we isolated tissue and uh, facts sorted based on the fluorescent color, extracted mRNA and did RNA sequencing to compare really control uh, situation to uh, mosaic knockout and uh, conditional knockout. So this is a control basically that in, in both these scenarios, uh, the uh, expression is actually down here, it's a time course. And uh, what really uh, puzzled us is that when you look at the deregulated gene expression between those two cells, again, these are the same genotypic cells. There's up to thousands of genes that are actually ectopically upregulated. So this could be expected because um, it's a repressor complex. So if you relieve repression, you upregulate a lot of genes, but there's also thousands of genes that you downregulate. So these are secondary effects. So there's an, a wave or, or an avalanche of uh, ectopic gene expression happening in these cells. But specifically, if you knock it out in the whole tissue, because this is a comparison to the single cell knockout here. Now, if you look what these genes are, uh, they fall into very uh, bold categories, such as uh, you know, wind signaling pathways and, and others. Uh, but then also we noticed there's a P53 signaling pathway and cell cycle. And this is of course more interesting. So, so we really wanted to assess this a bit more broadly and we saw there's a bunch of cell cycle genes that are up and down regulated as there are cell death and apoptosis genes up and down regulated. 
Now, the interesting thing really is this is specific to the full knockout or the global knockout, the CQO situation here. So when we label EU incorporation, we really see that the drop uh, of incorporation is specific for this uh, CQO scenario, but not in the mosaic. Uh, so the gray and the black, again, it's the same genotype of these cells. Similarly, the cell death um, is also uh, only elevated if you knock out uh, this PLC2 activity in the entire cortex. Now, uh, this uh, raises a few questions, namely, um, it, it is known that microcephaly is often associated with mutations in genes, of course, regulating cell cycle, renal repair, and chromatin organization. But what also has been shown is that um, if you lose or if you knock out P53 uh, together with those mutations, you can actually rescue, in some instances, the microcephaly phenotype. So, so we were wondering if um, our phenotype is P53 uh, dependent. So we brought in uh, the P53 mutation, and this is the data. So long story short, actually microcephaly cannot be rescued. So it's a P53 independent uh, pathway. So this is shown here. So this is a control situation. Everything is wild type. Uh, we have a nice cortex, uh, and the appropriate thickness. When we uh, knock out P53 alone, uh, there's no big difference. Um, there's a slight increase, uh, but not really much. But then when we compare this to the EDCKO, so here also is our EB uh, knockout. We have the very strong microcephaly together with P53. We do not really change significantly the extent of the microcephaly. So this really shows that this microcephaly uh, is independent of P53. Now we wanted to know um, what are the direct target genes and the indirect effects of these massive deregulated gene expression for that. Uh, we actually uh, took a reference here uh, that was produced by the uh, Wieland Huttner lab, namely they actually uh, did a chip seek experiment to actually map um, the, the sites in the genome where uh, this uh, histone methylation occurs. And we rationalized that if we overlay this with gene expression, you can actually predict uh, what is a, a direct target gene versus indirect target genes. So when we remove ED, um, you would uh, expect ectopic expression of, gene ex uh, of genes, of course. And if this correlates with the presence of this uh, histone methylation, uh, this would indicate these are actually then the PSC2 direct target genes. So they are upregulated. But then if uh, they are not correlated with the histone mark, uh, these are secondary effects. So they can be upregulated or downregulated. Um, so our bioinformatician, then plotted these genes. And the interesting part is that the direct targets, actually, they are much increased in the global knockout when compared to single cell knockout. That's the first finding. But the second is that the direct target genes, they actually really the true uh, PLC2 target genes uh, uh, relating to embryonic organ development. So PLC2 is very important in the early embryo. And these are really the genes uh, that are required. There's also uh, axonogenesis genes, which is interesting, uh, probably for another reason. But then when we look at the secondary effects, these are uh, massively increased in number, first of all, and again, uh, uh, really high in, in the CTO condition. But now when we look at the secondary effects, they really uh, strongly relate to DNA repair, recombination, replication, etc. And uh, here uh, is actually a network. So a direct target, um, there's a smaller number of direct targets, but then that deregulates a whole network of uh, secondary uh, effects here, and they uh, relate also to cell cycle uh, progression. Uh, this is shown here uh, for two of these genes uh, that basically um, in a white type scenario, when you have a lot of methylation, you would not express those. That's true in the control and also in our mosaic. But uh, then in our uh, conditional knockout, global knockout, then these are ectopically expressed. And vice versa, a gene which is normally expressed in a control is also expressed in a mosaic knockout, but then downregulated only specifically in our CK. So we believe that really uh, this uh, aberrant gene expression is the cause uh, of, of the phenotype here. So to summarize, um, um, we have shown that uh, basically uh, Knocking out this PLC2 complex leads to a deregulation of a relatively small or a smaller number of direct target genes, uh, and they're not uh, related much to cell cycle or apoptosis. But then uh, these trigger massive secondary effects up to thousands of, of deregulated genes, including now cell cycle regulators and 
with sulfatoins and cell death. And we cannot rescue the microcephaly by loss of P53. Um, so uh, finally, um, we also looked whether PSC2 has uh, additional functions in lineage progression, in particular in, in glia production. And um, this is the data. So this is the second last data slide. Basically, what you see um, is yes, um, PSC2 is also involved in production of astrocytes. So this is a white time situation here where we can easily spot because of the sparse labeling uh, the astrocytes. But then when we knock out ED. Now there's a cell autonomous uh, requirement. So this is not a conditional knockout because it's not microcephalic, but a single cell knockout leads to a massive decrease in astrocytes. We also did a time course and uh, it basically starts at very early a a time point in the first post negative week. And then uh, this is at the very low level here if you knock out ED in the mosaic fashion. We also confirmed this by clonal analysis. So again, we induced clones uh, at uh, ED11 and then analyze three weeks postnatally. And if we quantify the amount of astrocytes per subclone is massively reduced here. So that confirms it's really a cell autonomous phenotype in these regular stem cells. Now, um, we also found that astrocytes uh, not only uh, are affected in their production, but also show morphological deficits here uh, if they lack EED. So there's additional functions, not just in the production, but also in morphogenesis of these astrocytes. And this is a phenotype that we are currently following up. So uh, we try to isolate also transcriptomes where we label astrocytes with a specific transgene and measure again uh, ED deregulated genes here in wild type and, and mutant. And we can see there is uh, quite a large number of genes deregulated. And this we really now use as a hypothesis generator in order to get deeper to the mechanism of first of all astrocyte production and also uh, astrocyte cellular maturation. Now let me summarize uh, what I told you today. So basically we assessed um, at the single cell level the sequential functions of the PSC2 complex in your stem cell lineage progression. And we found that there's uh, at least two functions. One is actually a global tissue wide one. Uh, and if uh, you don't have PSC2 uh, at these early stages in the neurogenic radioglia, this leads to uh, this massive microcephaly, as we have seen, but only if you knock it out in the entire tissue. But then in contrast, if you knock out ESC, uh, a PSC2 function in astrocyte progenitors, this uh, cell autonomously leads to a problem in astrocyte production and uh, maturation. Now, uh, I also want to thank the people involved here. So most of the work I've shown you today is actually done by Nikki here, a postdoc. She's actually soon to be uh, on the job market here uh, together with uh, Florian Powler. And, and um, I also want to acknowledge, of course, our funding and a few of our uh, collaborators, uh, especially uh, actually uh, Thomas Rülicke, who helped us generating mad and mice. And I mentioned uh, Song Hai Shi, uh, who, who also and was Marine with whom we collaborated for the lineage uh, tracing. Um, yeah, so with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention.